This is a talk about removing debug intrinsics from LLVM. What are debug intrinsics, you might ask? Well, we've got an example here. In this slide, I've got some debug value intrinsics, and the important thing about them is they have a position in the program, and they connect to a value in the program as well, and they've got even more metadata. We're going to ignore almost everything about them in this talk today, except for the fact that they have a position, and they are an intrinsic in the function. Why is it that they're an intrinsic? Um, well, there's no principled reason, as it turns out. Uh, it's just a good and useful container to store information in that was convenient in LVM when all of this was designed. It doesn't have to be in an intrinsic. And I think it's universally accepted that this design is not a good design. There are a number of bad things about it that we'd like to change. Why is it bad? Well, fundamentally, it mixes up data and metadata. Uh, when you're looking at some data in LLVM, it may be a debug intrinsic and you may need to ignore it, or could, it could be real. If you put a upper or lower bound on your optimization pass, saying, I want to look at blocks of this kind of size, you need to know that some of those instructions in your block may be fake instructions that don't count. Or if you're doing a people optimization and you look at the instructions either side of your selected instruction, you need to know to skip over debug intrinsics. Uh, and if you don't know to do this, when the end user, the developer, adds debug info to their build, your optimization will produce different results than before. And fundamentally, debug info changing code gen decisions is really stupid. Uh, it's also incredibly poor performance. Um, a few years ago, there was an experiment that found about 50% of opt um, spent its time with debug info just stepping through debug intrinsics. They can appear in packs of hundreds at a time between every single instruction in your program. They're completely irrelevant um, to the, uh, the optimization that's happening. It just has to step through them. For a large uh, internal C++ code base we have, for a full RTO link, it spends 30% of its time maintaining variable location information, which is an absolutely huge amount of time for what it is. But all of these things, uh, the, the poor compile time performance and the change in code when you add debug info, that just annoys developers. Uh, it doesn't actually block them from getting their work done. Um, so no one's really had any strong incentive to change it. But, but now we would quite like to do that because um, it's just a continuous ongoing burden. What would a new variable location design look like? Well, first of all, it would be efficient, we hope. Um, it would not stuff irrelevant metadata into the middle of LLVMIR's data structures. And by doing that, then it would not interfere with optimization decisions, because there would be nothing getting in the way of optimization decisions. But there's a very high level objective, which is it should produce the same dwarf and the same binaries as outputs. Uh, in one representation or a new representation that we move to because uh, we're only changing how the information is stored. It absolutely shouldn't change what it means. So identical binaries is a definite requirement. Um, and we've implemented this and it works at Sony. Um, we've got an initial prototype. If you go to the discourse post, there's a link to a patch that contains all these changes. And I'm not going to talk about that today in terms of the new implementation that we've been trying, because ultimately where we've moved the debug info to isn't quite that interesting, um, and it's going to change in the future. What's really interesting is we are going to have to change the instruction API and potentially change some optimization passes to support this action. And that's the answer to the question on the slide today. What would it take to remove debug intrinsics? It would take action from you guys, you optimization path authors, to get on board with a change to LLVM's instruction API. But everyone in this room is, in one form or another, a compiler engineer. Um, so I'd like to describe the problem in terms of languages. Uh, we can think of our optimization passes as being a high-level language that speaks to LLVM IR blocks and functions in a transformation language. On the left-hand side of the slide, we've got a kind of high-level concept of, I want to join these two blocks together, which LLVM implements on the right-hand side of the slide using a method called splice. There are high-level ideas of, I want to insert an instruction here, or I want to iterate over instructions and examine these instructions. Uh, this is fundamental to the optimization pass, and it's just a coincidence that we implement it today in C++ and that we have methods and iterators and other C++ construct constructs for expressing that language. 
One of the good things about us storing information in Intrinsics is we get lots of automatic behavior for free because the metadata is an instruction. Like when we join basic blocks together, we just copy all of the instructions from one block into the other block. So all the metadata goes with it by default. Automatic behavior, great. What a wonderful abstraction. On the other hand, whenever you examine an instruction, if you want your optimization path to behave the same, you always have to check this instruction that has this property. Is it a real instruction or is it a debug info instruction? Which is bad, it's awkward, it's verbose, it's annoying, um, and it is not a good abstraction of debug info metadata. Um, I've got a couple of examples on the next two slides of scenarios where that automatic behavior uh, is actually really difficult um, and that we need to make changes to support it. Uh, if we were really clever people, um, we can change the language on the left by adding some kind of abstraction. We can change its semantics so that we can have automatic uh, updating of debug info behavior so that we can all write our passes without thinking about debugging information. And what we tell the instruction API is enough to automatically update debug info in the background. That would be great. And we can get there, but we've got to consider two major problems that occur along the way that come from these automatic behaviors uh, which will no longer be present once we remove instructions. Here's one of them. Uh, it's in the move before method, which I imagine we're all familiar with. Look at the IR on the right-hand side. Say we want to move the multiply instruction from the second block up into the first block, perhaps because we're doing some kind of CSE or hoisting, um, in which case, great, it's just going to be moved up into that position using the move before method. But also, Perhaps we are folding the two basic blocks together. After all, there's an unconditional branch from the first block into the second block. Maybe we're just concatenating the contents of the block. And many parts of LLVM just loop over the contents of a block, moving individual instructions from one place to another. And if we do that today, because that debug value there is A intrinsic, it will move with the other instructions as well. If we take uh, debugging information out of the instruction stream and out of intrinsics, that will no longer happen by default. We are going to have to rely on the move before method to know uh, when I'm moving this multiply up and I'm folding these blocks, uh, the debugging information has to move with it too. But move before, it can't know because there's more information happening here. We've got two different use cases, hoisting and folding blocks together, where the same thing happens with the same iterators and the same function calls for different reasons. There is an intention behind what is going on here of whether or not the blocks are being folded or if just one instruction is being moved that is not expressed in the APIs we have in LLVM today. So there's missing intentional information. Here's a second example which I call the head insertion problem. Imagine we're syncing the add instruction in the first block into the second block at the start because it's uh, folding predecessor blocks into their successors perhaps. Today, if we do that, we're going to call begin on block two. We're going to get an iterator to the first instruction. It's that debug value. And we're going to move that add down into it. And the resulting order will be add, debug value, multiply. Great. On the other hand, maybe for entirely different reasons, we're going to move that add into the second block because we're going to fuse it into the multiply or something like that. We're going to select an iterator to the multiply instruction and move the add down there. And so the eventual order will be debug value, add, multiply. OK, fine. Uh, but if we then remove the uh, intrinsics and the instructions, um, and we move the debug info out of blocks, then the begin function for the block is no longer going to return an iterator to a debug value instruction. It's just going to return an iterator to the multiply. And we can't distinguish those two use cases anymore. Uh, if we see an, an add moving down to the multiply, maybe it's because we're intending for it to come at the very start of the block, or maybe it's a coincidence. There's an intentional information in what the optimization path is doing that is not communicated in our current API design, um, and which means that we can't pick the right outcome for any debugging information at the very start of this block, just with the uh, API calls that we have today. Uh, this is bad and awkward, and it needs solving. And so I've got a proposal of the abstraction that we need to add to the instruction API that can let us do all of this by default, and it is this. Does the transformation you're performing intend on preserving the original source instruction order? If you look at the top part of the slide on the left-hand side, we've got our two blocks again, 
and moving over to the right-hand side, they've been folded together. And let's say we intend for them to be folded together. The instruction order is just the same. It goes add, subtract, branch. Uh, I call this a preserving transformation because it is the intention of the transformation that they stay in that original order. It's not a coincidence that this happens. Or on the bottom half of the slide, uh, on the left-hand side, let's say we sync from block one the add instruction down into both of its successors. So we duplicate it and sync it, and we have what's on the right-hand side on each side of the uh, resulting blocks, add, subtract, branch, and in the second block, add, subtract, branch. It's preserved the order of instructions again, and it intends for them to be in the same order. It's a preserving transformation. Uh, and I'm bad at Windows, it turns out. Um, the uh, curiously, the background, sorry, the inverse of the bottom part of the slide is not a preserving transformation. If we were to CSE the add up into a parent block, that wouldn't be a preserving transformation. Um, I don't have time to talk about that today. It's due to it reducing the number of paths through the program. Ask me about it later, please. But that information, this preserving transformation information, if we can communicate that whenever we move instructions around in LLVM, that is sufficient for us to um, reconstruct automatically all the information that is implicitly embedded in the movement of instructions, debug instructions, around basic blocks. Uh, it's good enough. We've built a prototype implementation that uses this after instrumenting many call sites, uh, and it produces identical binaries for some very large internal C++ projects, uh, the dwarf and the uh, generated code as well. So this is my bargain with you today, dear optimization pass authors. Authors, if you can tell me w the intentionality, this whether or not your transformation preserves the flow of instructions as in the source order, we'll take care of all the debug info in the background automatically for you, so that you don't have to. Um, it can be done, and we can demonstrate that it can be done, and it's going to be faster. Uh, at compile time, it's going to be less of a burden on optimization pass authors. It's going to be more stable when people add debug info to their builds. There is then just the small matter of actually what the changes to the API need to be, uh, and thus what we all have to suffer. Proposal one, um, we've got to take the move before method and split it into two. If we go back to our example before of us hoisting that multiply instruction, uh, are we moving it up because we intend it to be flowing in the same order as before? It's a preserving transformation. Or is it a coincidence that this multiply is moving into its parent block and it's going to be in the same order? Uh, we'll have a move before breaking method that says it, the intention is to break the flow of, of instructions. And a move before preserving uh, method that says I intend for this to be in the same order. And the difference using the design today would be that the second call, move before preserving, would move that debug value with the multiply, whereas the other one would not. Simple enough. Uh, there are only 30 call sites in the compiler that really need move before preserving. There are a couple of hundreds that need move before breaking. So it's fairly easy to think about. You would need to use preserving very rarely. Problem number two is more difficult. Uh, this head insertion problem, if we remember RIR, if we sync the add instruction down into the second block, how can we work out that the intention of the caller was that the add is supposed to be at the very beginning of the block before any debug info that happens to be there? And it's the difference in the two blocks of C++ on the left-hand side. The first one intends for the iterator that it gets to be at the very start of the block, its get first insertion point. Whereas for the second bit of C++ that iterates over instructions, uh, it's looking for something, it's um, applying a predicate to instructions, then it's getting an iterator to the instruction it wants, um, and then moving an instruction there. So it might move something to the start of the block by coincidence. How can we distinguish these two use cases? I have a uh, proposal that, um, that works which is to add an additional bit to the basic block iterator class that gets set by get first insertion point. I was expecting booze or maybe rotten fruit. Uh, it feels like vandalism because it's taking a value type, it's just a wrapper around a pointer, and adding more data to it. But there are a few hundred call sites in the compiler, and it's fairly tricky to unpick them to distinguish these two use cases and this intention behind it. In addition, we'd also have to pass around uh, instruction iterators a little more often uh, than we pass around instruction pointers to preserve this information. But the measurements we've made, that the impact of this is fairly low, um, and um, uh, it's 
well, it's a worthy trade-off, in my opinion, for the results that we're going to get. So only those two changes are needed uh, for getting rid of debug intrinsics from the LLVM uh, debugging information implementation. Uh, we can get rid of them so long as we supply this intentionality behind the, the movement of instructions of whether or not they are in the same order. There are other ways that we could implement the, this in C++. We need the same information, but we could do it in different ways. Maybe we could have um, uh, get first insertion point here return something with a different type. Um, and you communicate whether or not something is intended to be at the start of a block through the type. Um, I don't think we all want to wade through template errors every day, so I wouldn't enjoy that. Uh, but it could be done. Uh, we could also try and uh, install more flow information about the source program into the metadata. And when we move instructions, try to work out whether or not um, uh, the movement of an instruction still preserves the instruction order, uh, we could try and reverse engineer this at runtime, uh, which would be uh, easier for optimization pass orders, authors, but it would uh, have a higher runtime cost. And I'd like to finish off by thinking about this in terms of costs, uh, using this five-dimensional cost graph thing. Uh, starting on the right-hand side, um, there are ongoing costs to developing the compiler. By that, I mean, how hard is it to write an optimization pass in terms of writing some C++? Do you get template errors? Do you get weird types? Uh, do you have to type out uh, function calls with lots of arguments? Um, there's going to be a little bit of an ongoing cost uh, from using an additional number of API calls that expresses more information. It's more than today, but I think it's worthwhile. That would trade against having a higher runtime cost. In this graph, I've got the existing uh, debug info design as having a high runtime cost because it just takes a huge amount of time stepping through debug info intrinsics, which really sucks. Um, and hopefully, this new design will be much faster. But we could choose to trade off some uh, runtime cost for making it easier to develop the compiler. Thirdly, there's the concepts cost which I think of as being a mental burden on pass authors. How many different concepts do you have to juggle while you're moving around instructions, thinking about the validity of your transformation, and then thinking about how you need to update debug info? There's a reasonably high concept cost for getting everything right uh, using the current design. So this design is going to have some concept cost because of this preserving transformation information that you're going to have to communicate to the instruction API, but I think it's going to be less than having to think about debug info all the time. There's also a failure cost. How bad is it when we use these things wrong and uh, things break? Um, there is a cost of having the wrong output or changing output from the compiler that we have today. Uh, a new design, how is that going to fail? I don't know yet. We'll find out. And finally, there are one-off costs of moving from one design to another that have to be paid. But it's all right, because we at Sony are going to pay that, so you don't have to, um, uh, which is going to be a reasonably large investment of time that we started. So in conclusion, um, uh, the current design is not great. Uh, it has a lot of bad characteristics. It's slow. 30% of a large C++ link that we have is spent stepping through debug values intrinsics that we, it's really quite horrible. We need information about the intention of transformations to preserve this information automatically in those circumstances that I demonstrated. We need to know whether the sequence of instructions is preserved in the same order as it was in the source code. And when things are transformed, the APIs need to be told that so that we can update debug info accordingly. There are different ways of doing this. Um, we could implement it in a variety of different uh, ways, methods, iterators, classes, errors, who can say. I think mine is the most balanced at the moment. Um, what do you think? Uh, thank you very much for listening to this talk. All right, um, any questions? Hello, and thank you. Could you go over the bit where you said you are setting a bit at the beginning of a basic block? Uh, and just explain that again, because I didn't quite get it. Sorry. Um, in that, we have the basic block iterator class, 
uh, that stores the location of um, uh, where an instruction is, and we need to distinguish circumstances where um, you intend for something to be inserted at the very first point of the basic block. Right now, that's done through the get first insertion point and the begin methods of blocks. This would be adding a bit to that class to store whether or not it was produced by calling get first insertion point or begin, or as on the slide, if it's being generated by get iterator instead to distinguish the intention behind um, uh, how that iterator was derived, as it were. Okay, that clarifies everything. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Hi. Um, what's the actual effect if you get the intention wrong? Is it only that debug info is um, becomes valid at a place where it wasn't before, or vice versa? Or does it have more effects than that? This is a great question. It's only going to break the debug info, um, but uh, we care about the debug thing. For the debug info, we want it to be right. Usually what happens is you get uh, variable assignments or variable values appearing on line numbers where they're not true. So an assignment to a variable appears to last longer than it really does, or it appears to teleport a few line numbers earlier um, if, uh, if this ordering information is not preserved. Uh, so there's, there's no, um, I should say, there's no actual bad effect on the generated code and it'll execute fine, but the debugging experience is poor and incorrect. Right. Um, any more? Um, I think that currently the debug info skipping, debug intrinsic skipping is mixed up with some pseudo probe functionality. I have no idea what that does, but that seems to be the case. So what would happen with that? So I've never seen a pseudo probe um, in all my life. Um, I understand it has something to do with profiling information disambiguation. I'm not sure. Maybe someone else in the room knows more. Um, and if it obeys or if it can obey the same principle of this you know, preserving transformation information, if it can be updated automatically using that information, um, which I believe it can, I don't think there's anything else to it, then it can just act like a debug intrinsic and be stored in the same way. Um, it might become trickier if it turns out that um, they need to be manually updated at various parts of the compiler. Um, I don't know a lot about them, but um, I'm hopeful that they can be treated in the same way as debug intrinsics. Okay, thank you. I hope so as well. Hi. How would this change interact with different optimization levels? Would it be the same as it now? As it is now? It should be agnostic to the optimization levels. There are some differences. You get different kinds of intrinsics at different optimization levels, depending on how much optimization has been applied. Um, but it should be um, uh, there should be no effect from uh, how many passes or in what order that you apply them. Thanks. Anybody else? Doesn't look like it. All right. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, we will now break for the poster session, and uh, food and drinks are located in the foyer. And uh, the poster session is in the Cambridge suite. Thanks. Yes.